Time with anchors Diane Sawyer, Sam Donaldson, and Chief Correspondent Chris Wallace. He helped put John Gotti, the most powerful man in the mob, behind bars for life. John's a double crosser. I'm a master double crosser. Now he walks among us free, though he was once a deadly killer. When you look at a total of 19, you know, serial killers don't have 19. Tonight, Sammy the Bull Gravano, the most important mobster ever to turn, emerges for his first television interview. His farm is being hit, man. I actually was good at it. How could you not describe this man as a monster or a beast? The families his brutal hits left behind. He's running amok all over the place. Time to go. Daily life in a brotherhood of gangsters. What did you say to yourselves when you're doing this to other people? While we're at the table cutting up the money. And the godfather, John Gotti, described by his right-hand man. I think his problem was that he uh, fell in love with himself. Before he drops out of sight again. Is this every day of your life? Thinking about where you're going to go, where you're going to be, who's going to know what, who's going to be there. Sammy the Bull, who changed sides and changed history. We played chess and you lost. Tonight, Sammy the Bull, the man who brought down John Gotti. Good evening, I'm Diane Sawyer. Tonight, the mafia, not a movie, the real thing. From the underboss, the second in command of the most powerful mob family in America. Not long ago, organized crime had a stranglehold on most of America's major cities. Here in New York, it was said you could hardly do business, transport anything, build a building without the mob somehow taking a piece of the action. But five years ago, the government struck a major blow against organized crime, in part because of Sammy the Bull Gravano, who agreed to turn against the Gambino family and its boss, John Gotti. We should point out, we do not know where Gravano lives. We agreed to meet him at an inn in a remote valley in California. But as you'll see, amazingly, he's not in disguise. He says he's prudent, but he's not the kind of guy who lives in fear. We don't know what you're going to think of him tonight. All we know is that you've never heard a real story quite like this. He is the government's prize witness, Salvatore Gravano, Sammy the Bull. For years, he has been living in the shadows, protected by the U.S. government from a long list of sworn enemies. You can relate me to a soldier in Vietnam who killed hundreds of people, maybe. I was a soldier of Gozanostra. I am a hitman. A hitman, the underboss, emerging for his first, and he says only interview before he retreats into the shadows for good. He agreed to talk on the condition that we provide former FBI agents for his protection and not broadcast until he had dropped safely out of sight. Here I am, the mafia. They have said you are the single most important witness ever to testify against the mob. I think I am. So there's a word that you use for people who turn, right? Mm-hmm, who cooperate. You're trying to goat me into the word? Is, rat, is that the word you like That's to hear? That's the word. So are you a rat? I look at it as I was betrayed, I betrayed him. Double crosser? Master double crosser. John's a double crosser. I'm a master double crosser. We played chess and he lost. Hey John, you gonna beat it? Please. John Gotti boss of the Gambino family, the most powerful crime family in the country. The most glamorous mobster since Al Capone. Silver hair, expensive clothes, an all-American gangster flashing a smile while breaking the law. Power has a way where you can believe after a while you can walk on water. And I think this is what happened to him. At one time, Gotti was such a national celebrity that when he went to trial for multiple murders, someone played the theme from The Godfather while his supporters cheered. And in the old days, one man would have been right by his side. If you take notice in the videos, I'm always a step or two behind them. It's raining, I'm holding the umbrella. We go near a car, I'm opening the door. They were literal partners in crime. On the FBI surveillance tapes, you can hear Gotti over background music in the room putting Sammy in control if Gotti's arrested. This is my wish. 
You got his friend? His pit bull. And his friend. A friend who one day decided to expose what he says is the truth about John Gotti and the murderous mafia. The judge would call it an act of bravery. What was the real reason you cooperated? The real reason? But was it to save your skin? I was just tired of the mob and tired of fighting. It was a door out of the mob. You know, I watched the David Koresh incident, and I used to say to myself, how could these people get so brainwashed? Are they crazy? Are they nuts? And then I look at myself in the mirror and I said, brainwashed? Here I am on orders, killing people left and right, and uh, I'm calling them brainwashed. There was a book written that said that you had a characteristic of committing murder with the nonchalance of somebody just pulling open a tab on a can of beer. That was about all it phased you and about all it meant to you. As far as being a hitman, I, I, I actually was good at it. Because you were fast and lethal. And loyal. I didn't, I, I, I believed in the life. When I was on your case, I dropped everything. Look over the list of the murders you were involved in. There, how many? 19. Serial killers don't have 19. Mm -hmm. We're worse than them. But again, putting it out, Hollywood, newspapers, we only kill ourselves. What are you worried about? We don't bother the public. Seems to like us. Seems to like what we do. Look at John Gotti. If I have 19, he has to forget about what he's got. When he ordered a hit, he wanted it done yesterday. He would send me to either supervise or control it or make sure the job got done. And I obviously did. When you're the boss, you're given the orders. You're credited with all of them, even if you're not on the street. But you'll hear in this report how Gotti's attorneys say Gravano is lying, that it was Gravano who instigated the murders. I think he was a sociopath. I think he committed homicides because if you had something he wanted, Sam, he'd kill you for it. Once a murderer, always a murderer, and they are allowing him to walk the streets. Cindy DiBernardo's father was killed by Gravano. So was Dina Melito's. How could you not describe this man as a monster or a beast? All these women whose fathers were killed say it's an outrage that Gravano went free after just five years in prison and now has his face on the cover of 200,000 books about his life being published today. Gravano argues he has a right to his life story and says he's baffled at the way even the New York tabloids turn on you when you join up with the good guys. The media treated me real good before I cooperated. I was a hero. Seemed like the more people you kill and the more things you do, I mean, you were a hero. John's still a hero. And after you cooperate, which is strange to me, you become a rat, a stool pigeon, a canary, the worst scum of the earth to them. We were anticipating this individual, Sammy Gravano, to, to help us devastate a significant amount of organized crime in New York City. And that's the deal you make. FBI agent George Gabriel, who was there the night Gotti was arrested, points out that Gravano helped send more than 30 mobsters to prison after he decided to tell all. Sammy Gravano was somebody who was going to open the garage door to the workings and the, the criminal activity of this family, and not just against the people we already had, but everybody else. And Gravano says he did tell everything, not just about the mobsters and the murders, but about all those millions made from gouging the public. I was making a couple of million a year. John was making, uh, I would say, anywhere between five and 20 million a year. We raped the community on a constant basis in every way, shape, and form. What did you say to yourselves when you're doing this to other people? What do we say to ourselves? While we're at the table cutting up the money? We didn't say too much. We just cut up the money. It was, uh, it was for greed. It's, there's, nothing, there's no honor in, in, in a lot of things that we do. Honor. It's a word that will travel a tangled path in our story. Gravano still insists it was a search for honor that brought him to the mob in the first place. 
He was 31 and had been an associate in the mob for eight years when he took the oath to become a made man in the sacred ceremony he once pledged to keep a secret forever. One by one, they called us down the basement. A small little basement real, seemed to be real crowded, dim lights, real smoky. And when I walked down, there was uh, Paul Castellano. Paul Castellano, boss of the Gambino family. And uh, he says, if we ask you to kill for us, would you? I said, yes. And he asked me, what finger would you pull the trigger? And I pointed to my index finger. The words were simple, he says, to place the brotherhood above government, God, and family. They tell you that day, if your son is dying in bed with cancer and has only got an hour left to live, if we call for you, you come immediately and leave his side. He says they pricked his trigger finger and put blood on the picture of a saint, which was set on fire in his hand. He just said, if you betray this brotherhood, may your soul burn like the saint. He really believed in it. With my heart and soul, there's honor, there's respect, there's integrity, there's loyalty, there's a brotherhood, there's a secret society. Uh, and these are words that I wanted to hear and that I was totally loyal to. But 14 years and a lot of lives later, Sammy the Bull Gravano has betrayed that brotherhood and the gangsters he once considered family have made him a marked man. I know the danger is out there. I know how they think. I know what they're gonna do. I know their moves, I know them. I was part of them. Is this every day of your life? Thinking about where you're going to go, where you're going to be, who's going to know what, who's going to be there. I'm not going to worry about this every single day of my life. I'm not going to stay in, uh, in Montana someplace, scared to death, looking out of the blinds. But if they walk in the door... And they have the gun. And they have the gun. I'm going in the box. Simple as that. By the way, Gravano told us that to become a made man means your father has to be Italian and, he says usually, that you've participated in a murder. When we come back, how a kid from Brooklyn became one of the mob's most feared executioners and John Gotti's right-hand man. Sammy Gravano told us that a lot of members of the mob make it a point to read Machiavelli, the Italian analyst of power at any cost. Well, five centuries ago, Machiavelli said there are two ways to survive. Be a fox who recognizes traps or a lion who scares away wolves. As a little boy growing up in an Italian neighborhood near here, Sammy Gravano may have been a little bit of both. In this house on a street in Brooklyn, Sammy Gravano grew up, he says, in a bedroom studded with photos of Cagney and Bogart. His parents, immigrants from Sicily, ran a small dress factory. What would your father have said if he had known that you were underboss of the Gambino family? I guess it would have broke his heart. Just like it would break my heart if my son or if my nephew or somebody went into the mob because I know their destiny. I know what they're going to do. I know what kind of life they're going to live. They're going to murder their best friends. They're going to lie and cheat their whole life. Gravano says when his father told him about the guys in the slick suits hanging out on the tough streets of Bensonhurst, New York, the words he used were a mixed message. These were our protectors. We got to never inform on them uh, or do anything to offend them. And we have to stay away from them. Uh, they're bad guys, but they're our bad guys. One day, some of them noticed a scrappy little boy. We a few kids from around the corner. They robbed my bike. And I start fighting like crazy to get it back. And uh, across the street, there was our local mafia hangout. And one of the guys rubbed my head and said, uh, and he says, look at him, he's like a little bull, Sammy the Bull. And it stuck all my life. The troublemaking kid was held back in the fourth grade, again in the seventh, and kicked out of high school for breaking the principal's jaw. I have dyslexia, and I have learning disabilities. And I always had trouble with teachers, authority, 
school, and I thought I was really uh, sick or demented or retarded. I don't know what I thought I was. And the kids ridiculed you? In the beginning, until I gave a few of them a beating, a good swift punch would stop that. I learned that real quick. But are you really saying you went into the mob because you had an unhappy experience at school? No, no. As I got older, and when I did finally go into the mob, it was for money, it was for greed, it was for women, it was for fast cars. It was being part of a society, part of a brotherhood. You were sent away for a while, right, to the army? Yeah. By a judge instead of going to prison. When you came back, you were standing at a fork in the road. No, basically, I went right back, right back to the old neighborhood, right back to the corner. I was doing loan sharking, stealing cars, doing burglaries, break an arm here, break a leg there. And two years in, the mob bosses asked for something more. 1970, you're what, 24, 25 years old. They tell you to kill someone. Did you think of saying no? No. I knew that this was part of the life. And whatever I was asked to do for the family, to benefit the family, I would do. I, but this is murder. I knew sooner or later it would come, that question would come. The target, Joe Colucci, a 26-year-old bricklayer, a friend. Gravano says it was all part of a mob-related love triangle. What, there was a great deception involved with it, too. You had to take this guy to dinner. You had to lure him into the trap. Right. That's the way we kill in the mob. We were all out drinking together. And uh, at the end of the night, on the way home, I got in the back of the car. And uh, when we pulled away and we went down the block, I shot him in the head. Twice. The body was thrown out of the car on a quiet residential street where Gravano shot him three more times in the back. The next morning, police were knocking on our door, and you know, they told me my brother was murdered. Jackie Colucci, Joe's little sister. I couldn't imagine who would want to kill him. He was with Sammy that night, but we didn't know, and we didn't find out until 22 years later. I remember something that surprised me, that I had no remorse at all. None. I didn't feel sorry for him in the least. I felt power. I felt like my adrenaline in my body went completely out of control. You were excited by it? I guess it's like an animal going after its prey. One of these days, I hope that he's the animal and there's somebody else who's the hunter. The shooting barely made a headline in New York City. But back in the neighborhood, the news traveled fast. Everything started to change. I would go to the same club with this goal and got online. And before you know it, bouncers, the owners came out and Sammy, no, no, you don't have to wait online, so you just come right in and- so You were a player. I was, yeah, I was in the, I was out of the minor leagues. I was in, in the major leagues. As Gravano's reputation in the mob rose, so did that of another young star in the Gambino family, John Gotti, who had already served time for a murder. Gravano says they first met at an after hours club amid music and gambling. And I says, how you doing, John? I hear a lot of good things about you. He says, yeah, Sammy, me too, you know. Did he make an impression on you? Did he have something? Sure. He was flamboyant. He seemed smart. He seemed nervy. He's a tough guy in the street. And meeting him, I mean, he's a good-looking man. He, he's got charisma. He's got personality. Uh, yeah, he impressed me a little bit. Over the years, Gravano became known as a hitman's hitman. He says, after the first time, it wasn't him who pulled the trigger. On every hit, there'd be a trigger man, a cleanup crew, and Gravano says he would choreograph. And what did it take to get killed? He says sometimes it was betrayal, sometimes just insubordination. <sighs> this Louis de Bono you're talking about, he's a made guy, he knows what he's doing. He's not showing up when the boss uh, calls him. He robbed us in business. He's running amok all over the place. Time to go. It just doesn't sound quite human. 
the way you talk about them. What would you want me to do? How would you want me to talk about it? Well, suffer. I guess I did that. It's not for you or the public to want to see me suffer or do things or whatever. One of the guys had been your oldest friend. Yeah. And you felt nothing then either? Oh, absolutely. Felt something. Tore me up. But and you wanted to be there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Why? Why? Because it's somebody who was real close to me and somebody I loved and I would want to be there. And I would want it to go right. I would want it to go painless, unexpected. Louis Melito, Gravano's best friend and Gravano says partner in the crime business. His daughter, Dina, went to Gravano for help when her dad disappeared. I sent Uncle Sammy. I didn't talk to my father in two days and he didn't go to work. There's something wrong. He said, why do you say that, Princess? I said, because that's not my father. I said, and there's something wrong. And he said, don't worry, I'll find your father. Don't worry about a thing. I mean, in retrospect, the man had my father killed two nights before. But he really, like, looked me in my face. Gravano says Melito was shot twice in the head and never knew what hit him. His body was never found. He also said of the death of your father that it, it killed him inside. What, when he put a bolt in my father's head? And that he wanted to be there to make sure there was no pain. For, oh, how, how nice of him. I knew the wife, I knew the children, and uh, I tried to help the family. But this is the life. He's in the life. He played the wrong cards. He double-crossed us. And he lost. He said that my father may have played the cards wrong. But boy, he was quick to take my father's companies and my father's money. That he was quick to take. He did not have the brain capacity right. to go out and earn money. So he had to his, take what other people have The only thing earned. he knew how to do was used his two hands to murder people, period, the end. But does it matter that the murdered fathers of all these women were involved with the mob, according to the FBI? Agent George Gabriel. They were mobsters, they knew the rules, and they knew that if they broke the rules, they were gonna get killed just like they would have turned around and killed somebody had the, their boss told them to do so. We told Dina Melito that on one of Gravano's murders, the trigger man was allegedly her father. It has been written, Dina, that your dad was there. Not to my knowledge. I didn't know anything about that. You haven't heard it? No. Because where did this come from? This, uh... Again, this is, this is Sammy Gravano. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's news to me. But what if, as the government says, their fathers were involved in the mob? Doesn't it make it different in some way? If it turns out to be true, then they should have spent many years or their lives in jail. Sammy Gravano is not to be judge, jury, and execution, if it turns out to be true. But for sheer cold-heartedness, perhaps nothing tops what Gravano says he did back in 1978, when Nick Sabetta vanished. Nick Sabetta. Mm -hmm. Now, that uh, was my wife's brother. That was an order from Paul Castellano. I was stuck with it. Uh, I participated in it. And uh, it's another one of those things that basically happened. That's another one that killed me. I mean, to see my wife or my mother-in-law, my father-in-law or people, it just tore me up. Did you tell them? Did they know? <sighs> no. What do you want me to go home and tell them I just killed your son? Or your brother? No, of course not. They didn't suspect? No. Your wife didn't suspect? No. Gravano says he didn't know that after his brother-in-law was killed, the body would be dismembered. Wasn't there some way you could get him out of town? Some way to get word to him to... I mean, did you owe that to your wife? There's nothing I could have done. I know it sounds easy enough to say, get out of town or do something, and you see that in the movies, but that doesn't really work in real life. If I balked about it or didn't want to do it or whatever, I was going to. How could you face your wife? How could you face your wife? 
It's very difficult, but being in the mob all my life, I am trained for this. I am trained for double cross. I am trained to con. Did you say, what have I become? What, with that blood on my hands, what am I? I'm a gangster. That's exactly what I am. When we return for the first time on television, Sammy Gravano's account of the stunning hit on his own godfather, the king of the mob in New York, the legendary Paul Castellano. They were told, kill them. And if, you, if it means you have to die there, then die there with them. Die there in a gun battle with the cops. Do not back off for this hit. Told there are 26 mafia families in the country, the rules set by a commission of bosses who divide up the territory. To get an idea of what's at stake for all of us, a presidential committee's report estimated in 1988 that the mob took in $30 billion a year in tax-free money. The report says the five families in New York jack up the prices on construction by 20%. At the center of this, Sammy Gravano, who ran construction and concrete for the Gambino crime family. I literally marvel at the sight of Manhattan when I see it because I controlled it. I literally controlled Manhattan. When I see it at night, those lights and everything about it, I think of Donald Trump and Tishman and everybody else who couldn't build a building if I didn't want to build it. That got me off. Plus, I made a lot of money with it. But to get control, Sammy Gravano says he and John Gotti would have to trade in the rules of Cosa Nostra for the law of the jungle. By 1985, he says, they decided to move on their own godfather, the Gambino family boss, Paul Castellano himself. Paul Castellano, what was the problem? There was a lot of problems. I mean, Paul Castellano wasn't a gangster. He was a racketeer. A gangster is a guy who is real tough. He's a street guy. He's a street hoodlum. He's a gangster. The other guy is more, he's more polished. He's not as tough. He's not as dangerous. He says Castellano wasn't really a mobster. He spent his time reading the Wall Street Journal and lining his own pockets. And even at a gathering of his top gunmen, praising the cops. And he says, you want to know who the real tough guys are? The cops, they go on domestic violence beefs. They don't know what they're going to run into. I mean, this is not something that you would tell your, your top hit teams in a family uh, after sending them on work every time you want somebody whacked out. Gravano says the final straw was what happened when some of Gotti's crew got indicted for drug trafficking. Castellano was reportedly furious that they had broken the no-drug rule and that they'd gotten caught. Everybody's afraid that Paul was going to move against Gotti and his crew. Gotti, he says, decided to strike first, turning to Sammy the Bull for help. Gotti sent his right-hand man, Angelo, and he had told me, he says, Sammy, he says, we're going to take out Paul. But this is a complete violation. Complete. Complete violation of our rules and oath and everything else. He says it took seven months of careful planning. The hit would take place at Sparks Steakhouse, a restaurant in busy midtown Manhattan frequented by Castellano. The killing was planned for December 16, 1985, less than two weeks before Christmas. How many people did you get together to do this? Eleven. Well, there was eleven of us. To throw off witnesses, Gravano says the gunmen were all dressed in white trench coats and black Russian hats. They were told, kill them. And if, you, if it means you have to die there, then die there with them. Die there in a gun battle with the cops. Do not back off for this hit. What about innocent bystanders, people coming down the street? They wouldn't be hurt unless they interfered with it. And then they're not an innocent bystander anymore. I had a 357 Magnum. And anybody who would interfere with the hit team, I would take them out. There's that whole myth that we only kill ourselves. That shoots that in the ass a little bit. Gravano reveals what he says really happened that day. He and Gotti were sitting in a car parked just a block away from the restaurant. 5.20 p.m. rush hour, a Lincoln with Paul Castellano and his driver, Tommy Bellotti, unwittingly pulls alongside a startled Gotti and Gravano. I said, John, they're right next to us. 
And I told John, if he turns in our direction, I'm going to start shooting right here and now. The light changed. I was on the walkie-talkie. I said, everybody get ready. They pulled in front of Sparks. They parked the car. As soon as Paul opened up the door, I saw them white jackets all surrounding the car. They were shooting Paul. Tommy was actually watching Paul being shot, thinking which direction that he would run, probably. But part of the head team was across the street, and they came across and shot him in the head a bunch of times. And uh, we pulled next to them. I put the window down slightly. I told John, he's gone. What did you and Gotti say to each other? Really not too much. It's not like football. We didn't get up and give each other high fives or anything like that. It was one of the biggest gangland murders of the century. This afternoon, police say that Paul Castellano, the reputed head of the Gambino crime family, and another man were shot and killed. They said it was for family only. The wake tonight for Big Paul Castellano. Gotti allegedly wanted to show his respects by coming here, but instead preferred to stay away because of all the undercover cops in the area who would like to talk to him about the murder of Paul Castellano. I mean, it glamorizes him in the paper like he did the whole hit and what he did, the reality is that he was a driver, my driver. It would be years before anyone would be arrested for the Castellano murder. In January 1986, John Gotti, a street guy from Queens, was elected boss of the most powerful crime syndicate in the country. John Gotti has succeeded Castellano as head of the Gambino crime family. Attained overnight fame as the man said to be the new godfather. At the beginning when Gotti mm -hmm. took over, did you think You'd done the right thing? Yes. And really put the gangsters back in charge? Put the gangsters back in charge, and we were going to change it around and make it what Cosa Nostra is supposed to be, was supposed to mean. Did he really know how to run things? Oh, he's smart. There's no question. John Gotti was now the CEO of a giant crime corporation with more than 2,000 members and associates and millions in illicit revenues. The captains, Gravano says, passed on up to 80% of their take to the boss. We had 21 captains, the Gunzlier, made members, And how associates. did it work? Each of them gave him something, right? Was well, he, he, each person gives to their direct superior, their, their boss. So you were giving him like $100,000 a month? I think it's more closer to $2 million a year. But, yeah, anywhere from a million two to two million a year, something like that. And how... Far did your tentacles reach in the businesses of everything, the city? Everything. You name it, we did it. Wherever we can put a situation together that inflates the price and we can have a skim from that, we do it. And you pay the price. So you're saying it was really true that the mob was that powerful in New York, that it controlled everything from what you eat to where you live to what you wear? Absolutely. To how you travel in the city. Everything had a tax on it from the mob. Just about everything I could possibly think of. It was, Gravano says, a complex interaction of legitimate businesses, like concrete and construction, and criminal methods. Sometimes they just make sure their guys got the bid. Sometimes they got kickbacks from other people's work. They did it, he says, by controlling many of the labor unions, from the garment industry to garbage hauling. You're talking a lot of money. You're talking a lot of industry. I mean, they take over an industry, they put their people in business, and, and free enterprise goes out the window. The families were able to shut down job sites to control the price of concrete, to control who picked up waste, uh, to control who got deliveries or who didn't get deliveries. If we wanted to stop a project, we can just go right to the teams to form and just say, run this by the book. Every truck that comes in, check his tires, check his, which is all union rules. Check if he's in good standing with the union, if he's up to date with his dues. That truck could sit there for an hour, but by the end of the day, there'll be 40 trucks, 50 trucks online to get in. They can't get in. So we'll slow that project down. We'll destroy it. He says sometimes fear alone would get the job done, but sometimes greed would help. Gravano says they'd negotiate and then enforce industry-wide prices. When you went to a uh, big bakery, for instance, and said, okay, you, you, your bread is 30 cents a loaf. We're going to make it 50 cents a loaf. 
we only want three cents a loaf. So you're going to make a big profit. So it's more of a negotiation. So that if you can get everybody to raise the price together, then everybody's going to benefit. Everybody but the public. The ultimate control is through fear. The ultimate control is the belief uh, by victim, by victim companies or victim individuals, that if I don't comply with their demands, or if I don't comply with what they want me to do, that ultimately they have the power of life or death over me. And what about drugs? Gravano says neither he nor Gotti got involved in drug deals, though they looked the other way when others in the family did. Not that I look down on these drug dealers or whatever they want to do. It just wasn't my business. I wasn't comfortable with it. I didn't like the people that you had to deal with. But you really want me to believe that with all that money out there in drugs, that you turned away from drug money? You really want me to believe that? That you had compunctions about the people? It's a dangerous backstabbing business. So it's not like I'm trying to stand on my high horse that I didn't do drugs. I just didn't do it because I didn't like it. I made millions in construction and Sherlock and not all that heat. With Is the there ever DEA enough, and, though? Well, yeah, it was for me. It was enough for me. I had a house on Staten Island, worth about a half a mil. I had a horse uh, farm, a 30-acre horse farm in New Jersey. I owned the office building where I was in. By now, Gravano and his wife, Debbie, had two children. He told her he was in the construction business. Don't ask, don't tell. It was a close-knit family, he says, traditional, living in separate but parallel worlds. When my wife takes me to this house and she says, I'd like to have this house, I'm looking at it as a hitman to kill the person who walks out of that house or into that house. And uh, that's the way we go shopping. She looks for the furniture, I look for the hit. If you question Gravano's story about the mob and the unions, you might want to know that five Teamster officials were eventually convicted. As for John Gotti, even though he was convicted of the murder of Paul Castellano, his lawyers say he's not guilty and that Gravano's story is preposterous. More of Gravano's interview in a moment. But for those of you who've been asking about the mafia and the movies... I love The Godfather. I thought that was the best interpretation of our life that I've ever seen. Godfather 1 and Godfather 2. The other one stunk. It was once an unquestioned tenet of life in the mob that you try to operate beneath the radar. Meetings at 2 in the morning in discreet locations. But that was before the modern virus, a fascination with celebrity, infected even organized crime. And Gravano says no one was more vulnerable to that virus than his boss, John Gotti. What John did is basically unprecedented in organized crime. Um, Prior to his reign, if you will, of the Gambino family, everybody was more, much more secretive. This was his style. This was his flair. This is what brought him down. Sammy Gravano says he knew law enforcement was closing in, but Gotti became more and more arrogant and flashy, traveling in his chauffeured Mercedes, famous for his $2,000 Brioni suits. In one week alone, he was reported to have lost more than $300,000 gambling. He bet the entire line every single game, whether it be football, basketball, hockey, every game. The FBI says Gotti told them he sold plumbing supplies and zippers, and he estimated his annual salary at about $100,000. He used to get up around 11, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. He had somebody picking out his clothes. He used to have a barber come every single day and give him a haircut, cut the hairs in his nose. It was a play to him. It was a performance for the media. He went in a restaurant one time and he liked the wine that was $50 a bottle. And he made Joe Watts go grab the owner and raise it on the menu to $200 a bottle because people knew that John Gotti liked that wine. He was obsessed with the whole image, not of Goza Nostra, of himself. Gravano says on one occasion, Gotti pointed out a couple who were staring at him. I look over and sure enough, they're looking at him. So I says, you want me to send one of our bodyguards over to see who they are or what they want? He said, no, no, this is my public. My public. From my teaching and my understanding of Goza Nostra, it's a secret society. We have no public. We recognize no public. We recognize nothing. Gotti would become a kind of folk hero on the cover of People and Time. Three times, the government tried to convict him. 
on racketeering charges for assault and for ordering the shooting of a union official. You find him not guilty. The Dapper Don became the Teflon Don. For the third time in five years, the government has failed to win a conviction against the man the government claims is the head of the largest organized crime family in America. Gotti emerged, I think, almost brazenly as somebody that felt he was uh, untouchable. Uh, to the extent that we in law enforcement could not allow that to occur, could not allow somebody uh, to feel he was above the law. The FBI wanted to show it could bring John Gotti down where other agencies had failed to do so. Three times he got off. He beat the system. Sammy DeBow was fixing the trial. I was reaching jurors and bribing them. And he didn't win the trial fair and square. Gravano says through a middleman, he paid a juror in one trial $60,000 to stick to a not guilty position. By 1987, Gotti had appointed Gravano his consigliere, the third highest position in the Gambino family. But Gravano says he was unable to convince Gotti that his high profile was putting everyone in the family at risk. Gotti loved the spotlight too much. I think his problem was uh, that he uh, fell in love with himself. He saw himself on television, in the newspapers, and he lost touch with what he was. That he's a gangster, not an actor. But by 1988, Gotti did have a starring role in the FBI's latest surveillance video outside Gotti's hangout in Little Italy, the Ravenite Social Club. Down the Ravenite on Mulberry Street, every captain, every made guy in the family was the report there every single week. No boss ever made the whole family show up at any one place in plain view and plain daylight. The mob doesn't work that way. They don't show up all at once and make life easy for us, which is what they did. I mean, nobody liked this. I don't think too many people had the courage to tell him to his face. And I would tell him, John, there's the whole government sitting outside the club. There's news people, all these people running around outside. What are we doing here? Why don't we meet 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and try and evade some of this stuff? And he would just shut you up and say, no, no, no. I'll show you. Watch. I'll show you how to beat cases. I'll show you how to do it. He showed us real good. By the way, that juror Gravano said he bribed to help John Gotti, he was eventually convicted of obstruction of justice and sentenced to three years in prison. Here's a new development in our story. This afternoon, the New York Attorney General filed a lawsuit against Sammy Gravano, as well as the author and publisher of his new book. The state believes Gravano has been paid for his story and is seeking to freeze that money so that the victims of his crimes can go after it. We're saying, show me the contract. And that very simple, that very simple request has, has been denied. So it leads us to believe that the problem that we can't see the contract is because the contract clearly states out the terms of the deal that results in Gravano profiting from this book. Gravano has refused to discuss whether or not he's receiving money for the book, but says he'll fight the case to the Supreme Court. Of course, in order to subpoena him, they'll first have to find him. Our portrait of Sammy the Bull Gravano, the man who brought down John Gotti, will continue tomorrow night at this time on Turning Point. Here's a preview. Tomorrow, the mob trial of the century. John Gotti was more popular than the President of the United States. The FBI tapes that helped seal Gotti's fate. Along with the betrayal by Sammy the Bull. What was the real reason you cooperated? The real reason? The intrigue, an alleged murder plot. Does Gotti know this? No. He's going to find out with this interview. Described by the mobster who, thanks to the government, has a new face. I wasn't always this beautiful, to tell you the truth. And a new life of freedom. You got a real cushy deal. Our exclusive story of betrayal in the mafia continues. I told him, I agree with you. He's got to go. We'll kill him. Last night on Primetime, we introduced you to one of the mob's most feared executioners. As far as being a hitman, I actually was good at it. He's confessed to 19 murders, including his best friend. I knew the wife, I knew the children, but this is the life. He betrayed us and he was killed. And he told us about the John Gotti he knew, his boss, the glamorous godfather. I think his problem was that he uh, fell in love with himself. 
Tonight, Sammy the Bull Gravano reveals what finally led him to turn on Gotti. You're making it sound like high school. In high school, you could throw a spitball at somebody. We use bullets. The FBI tapes that helped seal Gotti's fate. And after the mob trial of the century, the question, should the government have given Gravano a cushy deal? We attribute about 30 convictions to Sammy Gravano's testimony. Doesn't the government worry about the fact that they've let a psychopath loose? And taxpayer-funded plastic surgery. I wasn't always this beautiful, to tell you the truth. And a new light, free among us. But the next time you get really angry at somebody, isn't it going to be tempting to use the old solution? Putting a face on the enemy, says Agent Louis Chalero. The squad itself had been really developing a pattern as to who would show up on what night, who would pay respect to whom as they, as they entered the club. For two years, they watched. By the winter of 1988, the FBI managed to get inside the Ravenite Social Club and place an electronic bug in the main meeting room. But still, they were frustrated, puzzled. We would lose John Gotti. Um, we would have his voice for a moment in time, and then within a minute or so, we would lose it again. The people listening to the bugs were saying, we don't hear John anymore, is he out of the club? And the surveillance guys would turn around and say, no, we don't have him out. And it was a little confusion, are you sure he's not out? We realized we had to find out and determine where it was he was going. By now, George Gabriel and 34 other agents were assigned to the case and the FBI was tailing Gotti and Gravano almost everywhere they went. It seemed like it was increasing by the minute. I mean, from one or two cars, um, it seemed to grow to four, five, six cars, trucks, vans. Neighbors in my neighborhood would come over and tell me, you know, Sammy, there's people watching. The break in the investigation came when an informant told the FBI about an apartment above the Ravenite an apartment where Gotti apparently thought he was completely safe from the authorities. It took months, but finally the FBI placed a bug in Gotti's inner sanctum. It was the Godfather, uncensored, using words he would always disavow in public, Cosa Nostra. It was the Godfather relaxed and, well, complaining. And then, through the music, in the same tone of voice, it was the Godfather talking about murder. The conversations were very direct, they were not guarded, talking about Cosa Nostra in terms that I'd never heard before. I whacked him, I had him killed. On one day, December 12, 1989, Gotti talks about not one but two murders and appears to be plotting a new one. For the life of me, I can't understand why he talked about so many people and so many crimes that we have committed that openly. I mean, I guess he felt very secure there. John had conversations that you, you wouldn't dream would occur. You couldn't ask for more. I mean, you couldn't have scripted better conversations. And it was just a euphoric uh, feeling. Early evening on December 11th, 1990, the FBI made its move. As usual, Gotti was at the Ravenite, meeting with his top hierarchy. The door bursts open, and the FBI come charging in. They announced that John, myself, and Frankie Lowe were arrested. And the three of us faced 29 to 30 um, top echelon Gambino captains, the hierarchy of the family, uh, surrounded by their soldiers. And John did something pretty funny. He says, we're not putting the cuffs on, we're not doing anything. He says, I'm having black coffee first. And he calls the coffee boy, Norman, bring me Sammy and Frankie a cup of uh, black coffee. They stood and waited while he had coffee? Yep, the whole three of us had coffee and they stood there and they waited. They were perfect gentlemen about it. And then uh, we left. Gotti had been arrested before and had beaten the system three times. But this time would be different. Good evening, Mr. Gotti. We knew it was real trouble. But you didn't know about the tapes? No. They keep you in jail. They say you're in danger while you're out. They had it on a silver platter. 
I mean, he gave them the family and other families on a silver platter. By the way, the government also taped Gravano in his office and club. And agents told us in thousands of hours, Gravano neither incriminated himself nor said one word against John Gotti. But Gotti did not return the favor, as you'll see in a moment. Outside the federal district courthouse in Brooklyn, supporters of John Gotti turned out in force. The theme from the film The Godfather could be heard amid the chanting and the crush of photographers. Celebrities like Anthony Quinn and Mickey Rourke came to see the hottest show in town. It was the final showdown between the government and Gotti. And it was inevitable, says Gotti attorney Anthony Cardinale. The government's idea is that Mr. Gotti uh, operated his own government outside of theirs. John Gotti was more popular than the President of the United States in their eyes. And that was the reason why it was a win at any cost uh, prosecution. The nation's most famous mobster had been charged with 13 counts, including the murder of mob boss Paul Castellano and four others. The jury was sequestered under 24-hour guard to make sure that this time no juror could be bought or intimidated. To this day, their names have never been released. And then on March 2nd, 1992, Sammy the Bull Gravano arrived in a bulletproof van surrounded by armed guards to testify against his former boss. Let's go. Let's go. Is this a just a year and a half earlier, when they were first arrested, John Gotti, Sammy Gravano, and Frankie Lacasio had been a united force, the top hierarchy of the Gambino crime family. They were taken to the Metropolitan Correctional Center in downtown Manhattan, knowing they could be facing life in prison. I said, John, if we lose this case, I'm going out the window. We could escape. And he looks at me and he says, out the window? We're on the 11th floor. What if we fall? So he says, no, no, Sammy, listen to me. He says, I got another plan. He says, down the road, he says, we'll put together four or five million, he says, and we'll bribe a president and we'll get a pardon like Hoffa did. I said, well, if you don't mind, if that's your plan, if you don't mind if I go with my plan. But there was no escape. And as they sat in prison, seeds of conflict began taking root mainly because of those FBI tapes. What did you hear? The backstabbing and the lies. Gravano says he listened in disbelief as Gotti badmouthed him. On one tape, there was a tirade about Gravano's lucrative business deals. And I told him to be you got a you got 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 and you sensed he was going to blame the murders on you. Well, the, ta the tapes, just like you're saying right now, sound like it's, in other words, poor John Gotti. He lost control of Sammy the Bull. He's killing people. He's got green eyes. He's taking the money down. He's got a big crew. He's completely taken over. Poor John Gotti. So. The theory is, by the lawyers, that the jurors could look at it that way, the public could look at it that way, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, John Gotti could be acquitted. Gravano says he became convinced that he would be the fall guy at the trial. Still, he maintains he would have been loyal to the end had Gotti only apologized. If he would have said once, once in prison, the whole 11 months, she said, I'm sorry, my big mount, you got indicted, Let's see how we can fight this case for somebody to win. I wouldn't be sitting with you. I'd probably be doing life in prison. I would have never cooperated. Did you ever go to him and talk to him about the tapes? What did he say? It's your fault. You made me mad, and I was talking out of my, out of my ass, is what he said. I'm trying to think of another word, but that's what he said. And I'm just blowing off steam. 
In the meantime, when you blew off steam, I was arrested on your steam. Gravano says for the first time, he began to believe he was a marked man, even if he were freed. And I realized that John probably eventually would take me out for no other reason, but he wants one show, one boss, or John Gotti. He don't want anybody to be his equal. He don't want anybody uh, in any way, shape, or form to shine. And I guess I was shining too much. You're making it sound like high school. Yeah, but the only thing is that uh, in high school you could throw a, a, a spitball at somebody. We use bullets. He says Gotti became so paranoid and verbally abusive in prison that Frankie Lacasio came to him with a proposal. And he said, when I get out, if we beat this case, I'm going to kill him. I thought about it for a second, and I told him, I agree with you. He's got to go. I said, but I'm going to tell you one thing. I've done too much. I'm not going to take anybody as the boss of the family. We kill him, I'm taking over. He shook my hand, he kissed me, he hugged me, and he told me, he says, I just want one thing. I want to be the guy to pull the trigger. Does Gotti know this about him, that he said this to you? No, he's going to, no, he's going to find out with this interview. Did you just seal Frankie Lacasio's fate? Frankie will probably deny it. I'll probably say, a rat, he's lying. But he could do that. He'll survive. After almost a year in prison, Gravano made the decision that would bring down John Gotti in a different way. When did you decide to cooperate? What was the moment? I decided that enough was enough. I made a list of people that we would have to kill so that there would be no retaliation. And the list consisted of his brother, Jeannie, who I really like, his brother, Pete. The thought of killing his son sickened me, to tell you the truth. So you figured there were how many people you had? Oh, about 10, 12, 14 people more. I looked at the list. I guess I looked at myself and I did some soul searching. I ripped the list up. I threw it down the bowl. And I made arrangements to call uh, and get in touch with the FBI. We were very suspicious initially. George Gabriel, one of the FBI agents who had arrested John Gotti, was there when Gravano agreed to turn, promising to tell everything about his 23 years in the mob. We were actually looking for what the trap was here. Somebody was lulling us into uh, this was a John Gotti trick to deter us from the work we were doing to firm up our case and, and give us a sidetrack and a sideline. We didn't expect it. We didn't believe it initially uh, until we started dealing with him and found out he was on the level. This is the deal Gravano and the government worked out. Instead of life in prison, Gravano would get a maximum of 20 years in exchange for complete cooperation. Then Gravano made a surprising request. He wanted to stay two more weeks in prison with Gotti before his betrayal was revealed. And they told me, what if you killed? Walking out, I says, I guess then we don't have a deal. Why did you want to go back? Why did I want to go back? I wanted to tell my family on a visit that I was going uh, to cooperate and leave. And I did that. Probably one of the hardest things I ever did. It was only my wife and my daughter. And both of them broke down crying and didn't want me to do it. Afraid for you? Afraid for me. Afraid for the kids. Afraid for the whole situation. It just wasn't the way to them. I guess the law enforcement was the enemy and I was switching camps. It just hit them and devastated them. For two weeks, his secret held. Then at 1 a.m. on November 8th, agents walked him out of the prison. Well, I just couldn't believe if what I was doing, where I was going, everything was moving 100 miles an hour. Gotti knew that night, from what I understand, a guard in the prison, slipped a, a note or a letter under his uh, cell door and said that uh, Sammy was taken out by the FBI. The next time Gravano would see John Gotti would be a year and a half later at the federal courthouse. 
I knew it was going to be like World War III. I'll never forget walking through the door. I mean, the only thing I heard was my own heart pumping away. It was a very, very dramatic moment. Here comes Gravano. We hadn't seen him since the day that he decided to cooperate. And he comes in linked by a massive array of FBI agents that had been brought in. Orchestrated by the government to have that impact and that drama. Gravano took the stand and we were all watching the first exchange, you know, of eyes between Gravano and, and Gotti. Did you look at Gotti? Yeah. He had this icy glare that he was staring at me to try to, I guess, intimidate me uh, with. It didn't work. We growled at each other a couple of times during the trial. We know what we want to do to each other. I mean, it's clear. For nine days, Gravano mesmerized the court with his stories of the mob and murder and his interpretation of the tapes. This Louis de Bono you're talking about, it's not that he's a legitimate guy who don't know what's going on. He's a made guy. He knows what he's doing. He's not showing up when the boss uh, calls him. It's a lifestyle, and these are the rules and regulations you live with. And when you break some of the rules and regulations, you know the consequences of them. The principal aim of the defense lawyers was to discredit Gravano. He's a serial killer, they argued, with a motive to kill and a motive to lie. A number of these murders were for his own purposes, and yet he came up with a story that somehow made them so-called enterprise-related, and that's the only way the federal government could give him a pass. But the government's case didn't rely solely on Gravano's word. They had Gotti's words on all those audio tapes. One of them, he's talking about DiBernardo. I was in jail when I whacked him. I knew why it was being done. I'd done it anyway. Can I tell you now, something about the tapes, first of all? That's the government's version of the tape. I dispute that that's the language on the tape. The defense attorneys also argued that on the tapes, you can hear Gotti complaining that Gravano instigated the murders, that Gravano was the one who moved in on the businesses of those who'd been killed. If you have something Gravano wants, he takes it from you. And if he can't take it from you just by grabbing it, he'll kill you for it. There are a lot of people who think you had the motive. But it's got nothing to do with money or the greed. That's not true. How do we know that? Take my word for it. Why would I kill my very closest and best friend for an extra 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 a year when I'm making in the millions? But I mean, people who have money tend to want more money. But they don't always kill their partners. And I wouldn't kill my partner for that. Louis Melito got killed because he betrayed our group. I saved his life, let him live for a while until John said it was enough was enough. How many of the eight murders that Gravano says he committed while he was serving under John Gotti as boss of the Gunbino family, how many of those would you argue that, that Gotti approved? None. None. Well, so I, I, therefore, yeah. therefore, are you saying that Mr. Gotti was too weak to no. stop you know, his the, the main right-hand man? The activity took place well before his introduction or involvement, if you will, or friendship, if you will, with Mr. Gotti. Well, eight of them took place after Mr. Gotti became the boss of the Gambino family, according to published report. But, but you know, the problem is that we're lawyers. Um, we, we deal with whether or not the government has met their burden of proof in a courtroom. Um, we, we really can't get into these other issues. If Sammy Gravano was this wild, ruthless killer, John Gotti would have had him killed. John Gotti would not allow anybody um, in his family to break those rules and go around killing people and be this vicious animal that they tried to portray him to be without killing him himself. It would take the jury less than two days to bring in a verdict. On April 2nd, 1992, John Gotti was convicted of racketeering and murder. The reaction outside was mayhem. Gotti supporters overturned cars, smashed windows. I said it in the court, I say it here. Our country is sick to the core if it is willing to pay for testimony by literally absolving a person of 19 confessed murders. My father is the last of the Mohegans. 
They don't make men like him anymore, and they never will. The Teflon is gone, the Don is covered with Velcro, and every charge in the indictment stuck. When did you hear about the verdict? Well, I think the day it happened. Did you feel pleasure? No, not at all. Not at all. What was it? Total disgust of everything. My, my life, their lives, the mob. This is the end result of everything. On June 23rd, 1992, John Gotti, once the most powerful godfather, was sentenced to life without parole. I think history will show that he took down, he took down with his mouth, hair for the mob, and this flamboyant style. Wait a minute, he took down with his mouth? Yeah. I'm sitting with Sammy the Bull Gravano here. Who's calling whom? The betrayer. I'm sure there's a lot of guys in prison who are smart enough to understand what John Gotti did by bringing the entire mob and putting it out in public view half destroyed it. He has to take credit for the tapes and the videos. I'll take credit for the stand. We partners. We started off as partners, we ended up as partners, I guess. Sammy Gravano would go on to testify in six more trials, and he was a powerful witness, helping convict 38 people, including the bosses of two crime families, 11 captains, a crooked cop, and the head of a New York Teamsters local. And one more thing, Frankie Lacasio, through his lawyer, did deny that he ever plotted to kill John Gotti. His lawyer said Gravano's claim was absurd. Sammy Gravano had a hand in the murders of 19 men. The FBI says all of his hits were mob-related. Last night, you heard from the daughters of some of those who were killed, women outraged that Gravano is free. We were intrigued by them and wanted to know more about their lives at home, more about their not-quite-average American families. Well, we, we were definitely not the Cleavers. <laughs> but know, Cindy Di Bernardo, who grew up in this vast mansion, says it was father knows best with a twist. You know, I was a young girl and all of a sudden you're going to school and people are like, they're making fun of you. Oh, you're going to get your mafia daddy after me and this and that, not knowing, well, what do you mean? What are you talking? And then you have to be afraid to go home and ask a question like that. Like, well, how do you ask your daddy that? Did you? I did. And? And um, his answer to me was, would you be ashamed if I was? I said, no. He said, would you be ashamed if I wasn't? I said no, and that's how he left it. She was 19 when he disappeared. The FBI says Robert DiBernardo not only helped control the Teamsters Labor Union for the mob, he was one of New York's kings of pornography. And today, what do you believe? I believe my father was a hard worker, and he worked and worked and worked until he made his own little empire. And the rest of it, the... Mafia connections, do you believe that? That's my daddy, and you can't tell me anything bad about him. The FBI says Laura and Karen Garofalo's dad was an associate in the Gambino family. He drove a Rolls Royce. He drove a flashy car. He wore a flashy watch. He, he wore alligator shoes, and I mean, he loved the finer things in life. We ate in amazing restaurants. Laura works at a daycare center. Karen is an elementary school teacher. They thought their father only dealt with criminals on the edges, as they say New York contractors have to do. We, we probably believe that if there was somebody that, need, that had to be paid, if that's how you got jobs at the time, then he did that. We, Dark. Nothing was hidden. We knew the people he dealt with. We also knew that he was a protected guy, that you know, nothing bad should happen to him. The women all tell of uncommonly close families with dad at the very center. He was a great man, a great father, a great friend. And how did you live? Oh, we lived regular, and I thought we were regular. I mean, the man, we had to have dinner every night, 5.45. Mm -hmm. Not a minute after, not a minute sooner. Dina Melito was also 19 when her father disappeared without a trace. The FBI says Louis Melito was a made member of the Gambino family. Two years ago, she heard that FBI agents were digging up a parking lot on a tip that a body was buried there, and she went to the site. And I said, is this my father's body that you're looking for? 
And he told me yes. And you stayed and waited? Mm -hmm. I went back every day. <laughs> they never found his body. The women say there are more than a dozen families who have joined together, even though there are reports that some of the murdered men once conspired against each other. How do you know what to believe and how to come together with all of these? We left that on Saturday when we met, and I'm sure we all walked in the room apprehensive about each other. Had your father been present when my father was killed? Had my father been present? And so on and so on. And um, we left that at the door. And we found unity in each other and support in each other. And when it comes to the mafia, these children of murdered fathers have a kind of code of silence of their own. And you don't hate it for what, it, what happened to your father is out of it, whatever hate they're involved the, the, in. the mafia? Yes. No. No. We all hold Sammy and Gravano responsible. Right. On April 19, 1995, Sammy Gravano walked out of the Arizona prison where he'd been confined in a special witness unit. He had just turned 50. For the next eight months, he would live as a phantom in the witness protection program, moving around by circuitous routes, using different names, hidden but free. You know, you get out of New York. When you get out of there, I mean, the people, there's so many nice people. I mean, I went to states where people actually stop a car and tell you to go ahead, walk, walk across the street. Do you see the irony in Sammy the Bull, please, that people have nice manners? Maybe because you're not a mobster, you never was, and you don't understand the life like I understand the life. To get up every single day of the week and just think about who's going to kill you or who you're going to kill or who you're going to rob and what's going to go on. And it takes some stepping back from it. It takes some getting away from it to realize certain things. As part of his arrangement with the government, he also received some unusual benefits at taxpayers' expense. Plastic surgery. You had some? Yeah. I wasn't always this beautiful tell you the truth. My nose was busted a few times and calcium built around it. I couldn't breathe. And uh, part of it was uh, to fix that. And uh, while I was there, I went with a top-notch plastic surgeon and I, I did a little nip and tuck. The government did pay for the plastic surgery, right? Yeah. But you look, I mean... I look like Sammy? You look like Sammy. A little and different. That's, and that's a little different. A little different. That's what I tell people. I look like them. This is what makes working or, or even owning a business, for that matter, very, very difficult and very hard for me. Did you think about getting enough that you'd be completely disguised? To completely change? Yeah. I really did. At one point, I asked the plastic surgeon if it was possible to look like uh, Robert Redford, but when he told me no, then I just stayed with what I had. We wanted to ask the U.S. Marshals why they agreed to pay for cosmetic surgery that didn't disguise his appearance. But they declined our request for an interview. It's just one of the questions being asked today about the U.S. government's treatment of Gravano and what ends justify what means. Under the terms of his deal with the government, Gravano could have served up to 20 years in prison. But the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, and two U.S. Senators rallied behind him, praising his cooperation. In the end, his testimony was crucial in convicting Gotti and 37 other mobsters and associates. Judge Leo Glasser said Gravano had been instrumental in breaking what he called the suffocating hold of organized crime. He then reduced Gravano's sentence to just five years, 60 months for a man who had confessed to 19 murders. You got a real cushy deal. Only because I proved myself. I could have did 20 years. Judge Glasser told the news media, what would you rather have if we didn't make a deal with Sammy? Would you rather have John Gotti on the street running a family? Would you rather have Johnny Gambino running, trafficking heroin from Italy to the United States? Would you rather this stranglehold continue on unions, associations, in every way, shape, and form? 19 murders and five years in jail, the judge had to say something such as he loosened the stranglehold of the mob, 
that's just poppycock. I mean, it's nonsense. All this was was John Gotti being uh, led up to the altar for sacrifice and to give the kind of benefit and the kind of prize they gave Gravano, I think, is a sin. I think he threw the most powerful punch at the mob because the option for every mobster throughout the country, as time will go along, will say, well, what would I rather do? Would I rather be John Gotti and go to prison and do the rest of my life in prison? Or would I rather take this route and um, get myself and my family and everything else away from the mob once and for all? He has admitted to 19 murders. It's almost like he's rewarded. So that means that I could go out today and go murder a whole bunch of people. But if I know, so to say, some major crime figure and I tell on him, that means that they're going to pat me on the back and say, you're a good girl, Cindy. Now you can go home. Just make a and deal with And you can live Janet happily Reno. ever after. And then you could write a book, too. And then you could make millions of dollars off of other people's misery. The families of the murdered men say it has only added insult to injustice, that Gravano also now has a book on the stands. Yeah, we just him. don't want him to see a dime of the buck money. That's Laura Garofalo and her sister Karen are filing a civil lawsuit against Gravano for wrongful death. Together with Dina Melito, they started phoning, organizing victims' families to make sure Gravano doesn't profit from the book he's written with author Peter Moss. I have not issued a uh, single check or advanced Sammy Gravano a penny in cash in connection with this book, Underboss. I don't know if anybody else has. We assume that Gravano has made a deal for a share of the proceeds of this obscene new book that's coming out. Last month in a Coney Island restaurant, the families all came face to face for the first time. Attorney Ronald Kuby has joined the fight. And we're going to encourage the Crime Victims Board and the Attorney General to actually go ahead and seize the profits from those crimes. Yesterday, the Attorney General's office and the board filed suit to recover any money Gravano may have received as part of a book deal. If indeed, Salvatore Gravano is not going to earn any profit from this endeavor, then show us the contract. And that very simple, that very simple request has, has been denied. So it leads us to believe that the problem that we can't see the contract is because the contract clearly states out the terms of the deal that results in Gravano profiting from this book. He wouldn't tell us if he's being paid, but says he'll fight the New York Son of Sam law that could keep him from making money from the book. But what about the millions he says he made off a life of crime? Do you have money? You need a loan? How much do you have? I have a few dollars. Eight million I read in the paper. Well, that's not true. That's not true. I don't even know where to get these stories from. But they let you keep your money. It's not that they let me keep my money. Nobody ever, you know, when I was indicted before I cooperated, they, they indicted us for crimes. Nobody was looking to take our money. Why would anybody look to take my money now? Nobody's taking John's money. He's in prison. Nobody's going after his money. Why should they come after mine? Did you bring down the mob? I think I exposed the mob more than anybody has ever exposed the mob. A lot of obituaries being written for it. Are they too soon? I think so. You'll never eliminate it? No. I don't think so. As long as you have greed and power and I don't think you'll eliminate it. The only thing is I think you'll put people into play who don't have the heritage, they're not being schooled by the old timers anymore, I don't think. They're more into not even dealing drugs, but taking drugs, using drugs. You know, this is exactly, works. this is the complaint about no family values. Yeah, it is. You run amok with no family values. Since Sammy Gravano turned in 1990, the government has continued its assault on organized crime in New York, moving to clean up the garment and waste carting industries, the fish market, the convention center. And in the current disarray, older mobsters are said to be going back to the streets to concentrate on gambling, loan sharking, bookmaking, and narcotics, while the younger, sharper soldiers are said to be getting into white-collar crime, mail fraud, phony mortgage companies, over-the-counter stock scams on Wall Street. 
And of course, new members continue to be inducted. As for John Gotti, he has been trying to get a new trial claiming Sammy Gravano lied on the stand, a charge Gravano denies. And last week, Gotti's fourth motion for a new trial was denied. John Gotti, the boss of the most powerful organized crime family in America, is now serving life without parole. He spent the last five years at the Marion Federal Penitentiary in Illinois. It, too, has a reputation for toughness. Mr. Gotti is kept in a tiny little cell. It has no chair in it. It only has a bed. He's in there 23 hours a day. It is deprivation on the, on the degree of a Russian gulag. Worse. He's allowed out of his cell just 12 hours a week. Visits are through plexiglass. His wardrobe now, prison-issued khakis. We're told by his attorneys he does 1,000 push-ups every day. If the government was thinking that if we sensorily deprive this man, if they thought that was going to break him, in fact, what, he, what it has done it has made him much stronger. The, I've never seen anything like it. We go to see him. He cheers us up. You sorry about him? Does he deserve it? What do you think after we, what we did? What do you think? As far as society is concerned, we all deserve it. While Gotti is officially still boss of the Gambino family, 33-year-old John Jr. is reportedly acting boss. News reports say John Gotti has sworn to avenge his father on your head. John Gotti Jr. I, I guess that's the way he would feel. But we're not talking about a boxing match. If he finds me, somebody's going home in a body bag. Maybe me. We'll see. That's preposterous. No one's going to come after him. Indeed, you, I can't imagine a sillier thing for someone to do. If, if Gravano got hurt or killed tomorrow, who's the first guy they're going to blame with it but John Gotti? If Gotti's not after him, what about the friends of Frankie Locasio, who's serving life without parole at a prison in Terre Haute, Indiana? Or the dozens of other captains and soldiers of Cosa Nostra also in prison because of Sammy Gravano? Obviously, Sammy is at a great deal of risk, uh, beyond which we're, we're not going to comment. Sammy still, you know, is out there, and we're not going to comment beyond that. The FBI C-16 unit now operates out of this office building in Queens. Their star witness says they never once lied to him. Thank God I dealt with a great team of FBI agents and, and, and prosecutors and people who lived up to their word. Uh, and uh, they just made me stronger and stronger in my resolve to uh, change my life and go in a different direction. You have a wife and two children. An ex-wife and two children. How do they feel about you today? I think they still love me. I think they still care for me. Are you in contact with them? I call on occasion to see how my children are doing. They didn't come with you into witness protection? No. She made a decision as a mother to stay with her children. And his wife must also live with something she only learned in recent years, that when her brother was brutally murdered, her husband was there. I think she was in a little bit of shock over it, but she really didn't say too much about it. A little bit of shock? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think Gravano is going to return to a life of crime. I think the seeds were planted before he left, and I think he has everything mapped out, and as soon as, as he is no longer the centerpiece of media attention and his book has reaped what other benefits it, it gives to him, that Gravano will be back to his old trade. And the scary thing is that he's got a lifetime pass, in my view. The government's going to be hard-pressed to bring this maniac back into court, and because it's an admission, hey, we screwed up. After less than a year in the witness protection program, Gravano opted out. You can't be in touch with anybody. There's certain rules and regulations that um, I don't want to live with. I didn't even want to go in the, in the witness protection program from day one. When I was sentenced, I wanted to come out of jail and just go about my life. The government sat me down in meetings and, and literally almost begged me to go into it. What do you do now? What is your life now? I still work out, I jog, I lift some weights. You don't use your real name? No. No one knows where you live? 
I hope. You move around? I move around. Move out into crowds? I move in crowds. Unnoticed? Hopefully. I'm having fun with my life. I go in a, in a positive direction. I just live a life like a normal human being should live their life. And I sit down and I smoke a cigar and I relax and I just, I love life. Isn't the game though to wait until you're relaxed, to wait until you're loving life? Right, but uh, I was a master of that game. And I'm not gonna walk into that game that easy. Gravano has now relocated once again. Since he's no longer in the witness protection program, there are no limits where he can travel within the United States. At the time this airs, big TV interview, book coming out, where are you going to be? In Kalamazoo. <laughs> I, I really don't know. I'm gonna completely uh, tuck under for a while. I guess for a couple of years. And uh, I'll just live my life behind the scenes and just watch it all go by. But the next time you get really angry at somebody, isn't it going to be tempting to use the old solution? That's what brought my life to a, a disaster in the first place. And you don't think I'm stupid enough to start doing that again. No, I, I, I am Sammy the Bull. I was that then. I am now. I'm, I'm, this, I'm basically the same person. But I've changed direction. And if I got mad at somebody, I would just walk away. I'd just leave them. I'm free now, I think, than I've ever been. There's no goes in Austria to protect. There's no orders to come down from the boss to kill somebody. The only way you can put me in that situation is with the hit team. When they come, it's gonna be me or them. If that ever happens, hopefully it never will. <laughs>